so it's a very stormy, extremely windy day out there, a little bit eerie, and it's also very gray, so hopefully the lighting's pretty good, and if not, I'll try again tomorrow. So, I have been on hiatus for a while now, a pretty long while. I figured people would appreciate a bit of an explanation, but when I sat down to write about everything that's happened and everything that's been on my mind lately, it kind of turned into a long script. But there is a chapter breakdown in the description box, so feel free to skip through it if you don't care to listen to the whole thing. I really won't blame you. But I want to start this video off with part of my personal story. I've always tried really hard not to get too personal in my videos, and this particular story, if I'd told it to you earlier, it would have just felt like I was whining on the internet. It's something that weighed on me, but there was no point in telling it because there was no conclusion. Well, now there is a conclusion. And now I do feel like it's a story worth telling. It's not exactly a traumatic backstory, at least not compared to other people out there. There are people who've been seriously abused, and compared to that, anything I have to say just sounds like first world problems to my ears. But it is my story, and it means something to me. So when I was a kid, there was this family. They had two boys roughly the ages of my two little sisters. When we were all young, our parents were friends, and they got involved in a church startup. We were the only children for a long time, and we ended up spending a lot of time together in the back rooms with few, if any, toys. As the oldest, I took it upon myself to be the leader. I made up games and kept us all entertained during the adults' long prayer meetings. The five of us were a tight little group for several years. Other families came and other children entered the picture, but we were still close. I have a large extended family with lots of cousins, but none of them lived in the same town as us, so we only saw them on holidays. Instead, this family became my extended family. The boys felt like my pseudo-cousins, and I had a deep sibling love for them both. But you grow up and things change. My parents were pretty great overall. You do the best you can, but there's no such thing as perfect parenting because there's no such thing as perfect people. My parents tried their hardest, and maybe they tried a little too hard. They had a tendency towards overprotection and overreaction. I call it fear-based decision-making. So the five of us had been attending a private school. I wasn't doing super well. I thought at the time that the other girls were bullying me, but in hindsight, I think they just didn't know what to do with me. I had terrible social skills and cried a lot and was sort of weirdly hostile. I was way too easily set off and the other kids probably just didn't want to get in trouble. So of course they didn't want to be friends with me. But by the time middle school started, I was pretty lonely and depressed. I hated school, but outside of school, I still had my little group, my sisters and the boys. So my parents were worried about us, but me in particular. So when I was about to start seventh grade, they decided to pull us all out of school and do a homeschool pod together with the boys and a third new family. I was ecstatic. I'd always wanted to homeschool and now I was going to get to do it with my sisters and the boys, my best and only real friends. I thought it was going to be the best year ever. But instead, it turned into the absolute worst year of my life. Here's where I think it all went wrong. There was us, the Patty girls, there were the two boys, and there was this third family, the mom of which was heading this homeschool pod up. I think my parents told her all about my struggles, and in their fear, I think they exaggerated. I think they made me seem like the problem that needed to be solved. You know, the kid that needed fixed. Because all I know is, from day one, that third family treated me differently. The mom and her kids were extremely condescending to me. <laughs> Every little mistake I made, they came down on me hard. One time I misspelled which, W-H-I-C-H, as W-I-T-C-H, and I got this whole lecture on, like, witchcraft. At the time, I was obsessed with Star Wars, but suddenly, here were all of the reasons why it's bad, and not just bad, evil. They told me, you're not allowed to write like this, you can't do your hair like that, you have to call all adults Mr. or Mrs. Blank, I don't care if you've been calling them by their first name all your life. It's very important that you pronounce the H in words like white or where, and I'm going to correct you every single time you forget. The girls have to do ballet for gym, the boys get to go outside and chase chickens. No, you're cracking your eggs wrong, do it like I showed you, and don't question why it matters. Meanwhile, we did very little in the way of actual schooling. 
I remember listening to some tapes, and supposedly that counted as French class. Math had always been a particular struggle for me, and I remember being given a textbook and told to read the lessons and figure it out for myself. I remember etiquette classes, where we learned how to position the forks to signal if you were done eating if you're at a fancy restaurant in the US versus the continental Europe. <laughs> It's very clear that the actual schooling was an experimental mishmash by people who had no idea what they were doing, and that they were more interested in molding me into the type of person they thought I should be, fixing me and correcting every perceived flaw. As a 12-year-old, it felt like every aspect of who I was was being picked apart and beaten down on a daily basis. The message I heard wasn't, you did a bad thing, it was, you are the bad thing. And, of course, that kind of messaging tends to manifest into reality. I rebelled every step of the way. I started acting out and behaving as obnoxiously as possible, which made the adults like me less, not more. I became more depressed. I gained a lot of weight that year. When my parents started to realize how badly this was all going, they considered pulling us out and putting us back in regular school. The third mom emotionally manipulated them through their previous fears. She told them that I was a suicide risk and that if I wasn't homeschooled for high school, I would definitely 100% get pregnant. Which is crazy and absurd, but in extremely religious communities at the time, it was about the worst thing that could possibly happen to your kid. I'm only scratching the surface of what all went on that year, but I've spent about the last 15 years of my life trying to get over the complexes that one year gave me. The worst part, the worst, is that that is the year our little group of five imploded. I still don't know entirely what happened. I know that there was incessant drama and fighting between the three moms. I know that our ages were a factor. Me and the oldest boy were approaching puberty, and the kids getting crushes on each other is something that had to be prevented at all costs. Maybe there was one key factor. Maybe it was everything together. Maybe their family had other stuff going on that I just didn't know about because I was a confused kid. But as that year went on, everything slowly transitioned. More often, the other moms sided with each other against my mom, and that dynamic reflected on us kids. The Patty girls didn't get together to play with the boys anymore. We all still went to the same pod school and saw each other every day, but eventually I realized we weren't even friends anymore. My sisters and I had become the odd ones out. And as much as it had sucked to be ostracized at my previous private school, it was infinitely worse to be ostracized in a school with only seven students. After that year, my parents pulled us out and we went back to private school. But the boys stayed and kept homeschooling with that other family. They left the church we had all started together and gradually disappeared from every community we had shared. For me, it felt like half of my family had been amputated. It was my first experience with abandonment, with truly loving someone and then coming to believe that they just never cared about you in the same way. Believing that you are the reason why, that you're the bad kid, the bad influence that can't be allowed around the other children, and that you don't deserve to have anyone. I saw the boys one more time when I was 14, and I was very cold to them. That other family was present, and by that time I had developed a pretty deep hatred for them. So then, two more years passed. This might seem like a deviation, but I promise that it's relevant. When I was about 16, I was getting interested in writing and world building. I had started working on my world of flying people and mermaids, and I had a self-insert character. But that's it. <laughs> I had absolutely no story. The story was, girl goes to world and has adventures. I didn't know why, what she was doing there, what kind of adventures. She didn't have a mission, and that's where I was stuck. Then one day, I saw my old pictures of the two boys. I'd hidden them away in a drawer in an old dresser, and my mom stumbled across them and tried to give them to me. I got all mad at her and told her to put them back, but it was too late. I'd seen their faces again, and I couldn't stop thinking about them. I couldn't stop wondering where they were, what they'd been doing, and how much they'd already grown up. The next day at school, I randomly had a meltdown right in the middle of lunch. <laughs> I remember going to a bathroom stall and just trying to organize this tidal wave of emotion that I couldn't cope with, and all of a sudden, fully formed from nowhere, the story was there in my head. It existed, it was real, it just needed to be written. Everything was so obvious. The girl had a little brother. I named him Caleb after the younger of the two boys. He'd disappeared when they were younger, gone missing, and everyone thought he was dead, but she'd never given up, 
She kept looking and eventually found a way to follow him to the other world and bring him home. It was the story that I needed to tell because it's the story that I needed to hear. I needed her to succeed. I needed the story to have a happy ending. So that's the story that I've wanted to share for a long time. I don't really expect people to care unless some element resonates with something they've been through. Lots of people have seen their early social awkwardness spiral out to affect other parts of their adult lives. Lots of other people have dealt with feelings of guilt or shame over things that were never their fault. Lots of parents overprotect their children and end up making decisions that cause more damage than whatever they were originally afraid of. And almost everyone has lost friends, had people walk out of their lives, and been left wondering what the hell happened. What I'm saying is, my story is not unique. It's not special. Except for one thing. My story got a happy ending. I didn't realize it at the time, but the story I told you was only the first half. I don't think many people get the gift of seeing their traumas redeemed in the drastic way that mine was, and that's why I wanted to share it now. I was a pretty different person when I went back to private school for 8th grade. I wasn't funny or bubbly like I'd been as a kid. I wasn't as abrasive or obnoxious as I'd become while homeschooling. Instead, I was very quiet and just very closed off. I stopped trying to make friends and just sat there and did my homework. The next year, for high school, my parents finally gave up on private school and put me in public school. It went surprisingly well. I had more art opportunities in a larger school, and I had access to a library. And with the larger pool of students, I did finally start to make friends. Sort of. I thought I was making friends, but I was still very emotionally detached. I was just happy to have a group to sit with at lunch. High school was by far my best schooling experience, but I did, over the course of those four years, start to lose sight of who I was. I am, and always have been, interested in two things, self-sufficiency and art. I love learning how to do things for myself, whether it be sewing my own clothes, raising my own food, cooking things, fixing things, building things, doing it for myself, having those skills and the confidence and competence, that's what gets me excited. But I am also an artist. Everything I make, I want to make as beautiful as possible. When I was a kid, the future seemed simple. I wanted to have a family, sew, homeschool, and homestead. But in seventh grade, I saw all of those ideals go horribly wrong, and it really disillusioned me. And as time passed, I kind of moved on. By the end of high school, I couldn't fathom the idea of dating. I had such a shield around myself that I just could not figure out how relationships even worked. How do you love someone? What does that even mean? The idea of ever getting married or having a family seemed utterly impossible. So instead, I decided to throw myself into business and become a successful entrepreneur. And if I wasn't tied down, then I decided I should travel full-time. I did a bit of that, and while it was fun, it did not fulfill me. By my mid-twenties, I started to realize that I'd based those goals off of other people's vision of a good life, not my own. I needed to learn to think for myself again. I decided that travel was not for me. At least not extended travel. I'm a person who wants to put down roots. I want to build something. Relationships, the land, my home, my crafts. I want to invest in things that are going to last for life. I decided that it wasn't too late for a career change, and I started a YouTube channel. It seemed like the best way to get back to what I loved doing and to make an income at the same time. Around the same time, I also realized that I needed to meet new people and expand my social circles. I decided to join a young adults group at a big church in town. It was a long, slow process with many factors, but I did begin to level out and become a healthier person. Then, in late summer 2019, I went to the church group one night and I saw a new guy lingering by the door. I glanced again and all of a sudden I was like, holy crap, I think that's Caleb. I was in absolute shock for a few minutes. And then I went up to him and I said, is your name Caleb? <laughs> he got this deer in the headlights look and said yes, and I just started laughing. He didn't recognize me at all. <laughs> Which was fair enough, because the last time I'd seen him, he was eight. So I told him who I was, and he remembered me, and we talked until the group started and it was time to go sit down. 
I went and got a seat and he followed and just sat down right next to me. You don't understand how big of a deal that was to me. I was always awkward around guys after the seventh grade debacle. I had this deep instinct to keep my distance, to not get too close to them, and to never assume that my presence was wanted. I would never have sat next to him, but he just sat right next to me like it was no big deal. For him, it wasn't that deep. He'd shown up to a group where he didn't know anyone. I was the only person he sort of knew, so of course he sat next to me. But anyways, after the group ended, we talked again. Everyone left, and the building closed, and we kept talking in the parking lot. I don't think we left until after 11 p.m. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking, but it wasn't that. <laughs> Keep in mind, at the time I was 25, had a career, and owned my own house. I didn't have myself completely figured out, but I was well on my way. Caleb was 19, a literal teenager. I was not interested in him in that way. <laughs> but talking to him, catching up, talking about our families, and trying to sort out what had happened all of those years ago, it was such a tremendously healing experience for me. I have never felt anything like that. All of the sibling love that had been buried for all of those years, it just came right back. All of the time that I had spent wondering, now I knew. I got to see how he'd turned out, how his personality had developed. He'd always loved playing with toy knives and swords when he was little, and now he did blacksmithing and made knives. For his part, Caleb had come to the church group for the exact same reasons I had. We were both just trying to sort ourselves out and take care of some baggage. <laughs> I felt like my story had come to life. I'd found the missing brother and his friendship was the most precious thing in the world to me. We saw each other and talked at group every week. We went to parties and movie nights that the group hosted. He called me every once in a while to tell me what he was up to. The more we hung out, the more in common I realized that we had. He was exactly the type of guy I'd always wanted to meet. I began complaining to my sister Michaela that I wanted somebody just like Caleb, but not Caleb. It couldn't be Caleb. The age gap was too big and there was just too much history there. And Michaela replied every time by saying, age gaps don't matter when you get older. <laughs> but I just didn't see it going anywhere. During 2020, we both stopped going to the church group. We still called every once in a while, but we didn't see each other much anymore. Caleb had gotten a job with a plumber and was working on fixing up a house so that he could move out. My channel had started to get some hits, so I buried myself in video making. In 2021, I got into my first ever relationship. He was a pretty great guy. We were fairly compatible in values and personality, but just not really in life goals. He's the one who ended it, which hurt at the time, but now I am very grateful. He felt we could both do better, and he was right. I wish him all the best. Later, my friend Anna told me that the whole time I was dating him, I kept comparing him to Caleb, which is a bit of a yikes. <laughs> I don't even remember doing that. But Caleb had definitely become my gold standard for men. I wanted somebody just like him, but not him. Then came 2022. Caleb asked if I could help him sew leather patches onto the knees of his work pants. So he came over on February 11th, and we worked for a whole evening hand-stitching these patches onto his pants. We talked the whole time and caught up. It'd been a while, and a lot had changed for him. He'd started an official plumbing apprenticeship, which, if you don't know, is sort of a big deal. It's hard to find somebody who's willing to apprentice you for four years. He'd also moved out of his parents' house into the house that he'd been fixing up. I don't know, he just seemed different. He seemed like he'd surged forward during COVID. It made me start to question things. <laughs> I called him a couple weeks later to help me pick up some cattle panels from a marketplace listing. Normally I would have called my dad, but he just happened to wreck his truck the day before. <laughs> Caleb said sure, he could help, and came right over. We got in his truck and drove to his friend Gabe's house to borrow their trailer. When we pulled up, Gabe came to greet us and he had the smarmiest, smuggest grin imaginable on his face. I knew something was up, obviously they'd talked about something. Afterwards, I called Michaela and said, you know how you've been saying that eventually the age gap won't matter? Are we there yet? <laughs> a bit after that, it was the first great day of spring, and Caleb called me up and asked if I wanted to go motorcycling with him. We went and rode to the lake and then stopped at a pier to talk. The whole time we were talking, I kept thinking to myself, I wish this was a date. I know it's not a date, but I really wish it was a date. <laughs> I was in so much denial, I couldn't let myself get my hopes up. Then there was a pause and Caleb said, this is a date, right? 
And I kind of had this explosion of air and I said, yeah, I think it's a date. And that was basically that. We were talking about marriage within a month. <laughs> so you've probably already guessed where this is going the big reveal the ever after gown was my wedding dress we got married on February 11th, one year to the day since we sewed the patches on his pants. I was going to do a reveal video at some point, like make a big thing of it, but it just never felt right. I wanted my mind to be present, not thinking about how many views I could milk out of it all. But I'll give you a bit of a recap. I worked on the dress and made videos for as long as I could, but then I had to abandon my video editing or there was no way I was going to be able to finish the dress in time. Then I also decided to make the bridesmaid dresses and the flower girl dress, which was crazy and doubled the workload, but I do not regret that decision. The bridesmaid dresses were beautiful and unique, and I got to spend a lot of personal time with each friend in the months leading up to the wedding, when they came over for fittings and to help me sew. As you can imagine, I wore myself down pretty hard, and the Monday before the wedding, I was suddenly struck sick. And at that point, my dress was still in pieces. I was running a fever and coughing, but I had no choice other than to keep working. My bridesmaids came through yet again, but particularly Savannah. She did the entire front embroidery on my dress. If she hadn't have done that, it would have all just been blank. As it was, by Thursday night during the bachelorette party, I was still sewing. You can see in the final results that there were a few things I had to substitute. I used different lace for the neckline, and I didn't have time to make the bullion trim for the skirt front, so I substituted with some antique trims. But with the final result, my only complaint is that I wish I'd tried a body tape or something to keep the straps from sliding down my shoulders. They were constantly falling, and it made the bodice look a bit baggy at the sides. I know I shouldn't complain, but like, there's always one thing to critique. Anyways, come wedding day, I was still sick, but not too bad. I was on my feet, but my voice was completely 100% gone. But in spite of that, the wedding was absolutely beautiful. It was at an old church that's been renovated into a full-time venue. Our photographer was amazing. Her name was Annie with The Ridge Photography. My sister Michaela planned about 75% of it, which was such a relief to me because I just wanted to focus on the dresses. That was the main thing I cared about. Over the whole process, our friends and family really came through for us. Savannah and Ava painted the invitations. Michaela designed the centerpieces using my collection of books and antiques and knickknacks. Everyone helped so. Savannah spent whole days at my house. Ava did too. Sayla and Olivia came to sew. Anna and Lauren helped with the bridesmaid dresses. Caleb even did. He invented a tool to cut the bullion wire and worked for hours every Saturday cutting me fresh batches of beads for the bullion trim. <laughs> even one of the groomsmen, Gabe, helped with my dress. I found out that he taught himself how to digitize embroidery designs so that he could make his friends matching patches for their motorcycle jackets. So when I ran out of time for hand embroidery, he made the starburst flower design. His sister, Isabella, did our florals from a bulk flower package. I was going to do it, but that was Wednesday right before the wedding and I was still sick, so she ended up doing about 90% of it and Olivia did the other 10. Ben, a groomsman, led line dances during the reception. And my other sister, Marissa, brought her salon friends and did all of the girls' hair and makeup. I'm probably forgetting somebody. Everyone did so much for us. 
They just step in wherever their skills fit best. Caleb and I are not rich people. We strictly budgeted every step of the way, but we still got the most beautiful wedding imaginable. And that just would not have been possible without all of the creative, talented, skilled, highly competent people in our lives that could just be trusted to get the job done. And finally, there's one very important group that I need to thank, my patrons. It's been a long hiatus and I am absolutely shocked by how many people stayed the whole way through. Without the income from Patreon during this time, I wouldn't have had a choice but to keep making videos and the dress just would not have gotten finished. So a thousand thanks to you all and I hope to make up for it soon. So the wedding was February 11th and we left the next morning for our honeymoon. We stayed in the coziest little cabin with an amazing view in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. The back there. Okay. We came back the next week and immediately started the move, like the second we got back into town. Early on, Caleb had asked me if I would prefer for him to sell his house and move in with me because my house is nicer. Don't get me wrong, Caleb's house is a project. Huh. I wonder if I need to replace the box fan. Nah, I think it'll be good. But his house is my dream. It's on a whole acre of land out in the country. No HOAs, no city ordinances. I can do whatever I want out here. I can have the biggest garden. I can get more animals. I can plant fruit trees, anything. So yes, that was tempting enough for me to move again, which means that I've now moved four times in the last six years. I am done. <laughs> I'll have to tell you the story behind Caleb's house another time. Let's just say there's a reason he was able to acquire it at age 20, and it's mostly because of how truly awful shape it was in. He put in so much work and every penny he made for two years to get it to this point. It still has a long way to go, but now we can keep working on it together. I promise I'll do a full tour at some point, but for now, I think I'll leave it at that. Yay! <laughs> Tricky's still like, hey, are you gonna carry me over there? In the past year, I've gone through about every big life change on the list, except for having a kid. My interests have definitely been shifting, and my priorities are realigning, so the type of content I make is naturally going to evolve. I've been thinking about it a lot lately, brainstorming, and trying to figure out what my future videos are going to look like. So let's talk about some of the possibilities. Number one, diversity of content. Sewing will always be my main thing, but there are other creative interests that I want to explore, like pottery, cobbling, painting, and knitting. I've got a lot of Ever After videos to finish, but I'm not planning on stacking them all up at once. I'll do them in between other new content. Number two, Caleb's projects. He doesn't mind being in the videos, though I doubt he'll want to talk on camera. His biggest interest is blacksmithing, but he's also done leatherwork and violin and woodwork, and now he does home renovation. Number three, house projects. I have a whole house worth of space to beautify now. Some of our upcoming projects will be more functional, but others will be purely creative and decorative. So I'm definitely planning to make videos on our house projects. Number four, homesteading. Now that I'm out in the country, I get to take my homesteading up a few levels. I don't know how exactly I'm going to incorporate the homesteading content. I might keep it as side content in my regular sewing videos, or I might make videos dedicated to a certain homesteading topic. I'm not sure, we'll see. Number five, history bounding. Unfortunately, I think I'm going to have to let that one go. I thought I could have my cake and eat it too. I've always loved costumes, but I needed daily wear clothes. I thought I could get both, but I really got neither. I will always look to history for inspiration, but I need to stick to silhouettes that I already know are going to be functional and flattering. Number six, costuming. As much as I love it in theory, the reality is that I need purpose in order to finish projects. Costumes that I start making just for the sake of making them, those are the projects that I'm least likely to finish. So, in the future, I think I will only be making costumes if they are for specific events. Which, there will be some. 
I do have tickets to an 18th century event in October, so I will need something for that. Number seven, clothing experimentation. I know a lot of people really enjoyed my clothing experimentation and learned from it, but I'm in a place right now where I really want to focus on practical wearable pieces, and I don't want to spend the time that I used to on projects that have a 50-50 chance of not working at all. I'm also really against the idea of sewing stuff just to make content. Number eight, sewing for friends. I've always had a huge fear of sewing for other people, specifically fitting things on them. But the Bridesmaid Dress Project really helped to break that fear for me. <laughs> I treated my friends like mannequins and pinned fabric scraps to their clothes and then draped the patterns. That's another thing that I would like to do on my channel that would be extremely educational, as there'd be more of a variety of body types for people to learn from. Number nine, menswear. I have never in my life cared about menswear, but now I'm like, Caleb, I want to engineer you the best pair of work pants you've ever had, and can I please make you a suit someday? He might, might start coming with me to some historical events, but I think it's going to depend on the era and if I can make him something that's like brown instead of pastel, he's not the type that likes to stand out in public. And number 10, video formatting. I think I'm about to enter an experimental video editing phase, at least for a while. I want to try shorter videos, longer videos, and YouTube is basically making you do the shorts. I want to try going a little lighter on the details with sewing tutorials. You don't need me to explain that I'm pinning and sewing and ironing the seams over and over and over. <laughs> Instead, I want my tutorials to focus on the interesting and difficult elements. I also want to have discussions and tell stories more often, and make videos just analyzing random things. For easy projects, it might be fun to make looser, slower-paced sewing vlog-type videos. So yeah, with the editing, I don't know where everything is going to land, but I basically just want to give myself the freedom and flexibility to get creative with it again. I'm just going to have to try things out and see what's fun and sustainable for me to make, but still providing value to you all. So I think that's where I'll leave off for this video, and see you all next time.